There was a period between 1979 and 1985 when the Cold War began decidedly more heated. Following with the international response to the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1979 and the more forceful attitudes of U.S. President Ronald Reagan and British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, both of whom largely rejected the policy of detente that had held sway in the previous decade, both sides engaged in nuclear proliferation and there was a rise in the low intensity conflicts called proxy wars at the time. And into this tense environment, just a month after the death of Soviet Premier Yuri Andropov, an event occurred that could have, well, sparked all-out war. A Soviet nuclear submarine collided with an American aircraft carrier. The 1984 collision between the Soviet submarine K-314 and the USS Kitty Hawk is history that deserves to be remembered. It was March 21st, 1984, and the supercarrier USS Kitty Hawk was in the Sea of Japan. Commissioned in April of 1961, Kitty Hawk was the first of a class of three so-called supercarriers, upgraded versions of the previous Forrestal class. Capable of carrying 85 aircraft and with a crew complement of 5,624 officers and men, the Kitty Hawk had served throughout the Vietnam War and continued serving in the Western Pacific. In 1984, Kitty Hawk was the lead carrier and flagship of the U.S. 7th Fleet's Battle Group Bravo, operating in the Western Pacific and North Arabian Sea. She had been sent to the Sea of Japan in March to participate in Team Spirit exercises. Team Spirit was a joint exercise with the United States and the Republic of Korea, held annually from 1976 to 1993. The exercise was designed to evaluate and improve the interoperability of the ROK and U.S. forces. Team Spirit was intended not only to improve security cooperation and warfighting ability with U.S. and ROK forces, but to deter aggression and provocations from neighboring North Korea. Still, the exercise was defensive in nature, and North Korea was given prior notification that it would be occurring. During the exercise, ROK and U.S. forces stationed inside the country were augmented by U.S. Army, Navy, Marine, and Air Force units from outside the ROK. Kitty Hawk, along with eight escort ships, was assigned to support Team Spirit 84. Aircraft of the Kitty Hawk, including F-14A Tomcat fighter aircraft, A-6E Intruder, and A-7E Corsair attack aircraft, an E-2C Hawkeye early warning aircraft had provided air cover for simulated amphibious landings by U.S. and ROK Marines. According to its official report, high tempo operations combined with adverse weather conditions constantly tested the professional capabilities of aviators and ship handlers alike. The operation, so close to the Soviet Far East, attracted the attention of the Soviet military. Kitty Hawk reported that over the course of the exercise, the carrier and its escorts came in contact with 43 Soviet aircraft, six Soviet surface elements, and one Soviet submarine. The submarine was the Victor-class submarine K-314. Designated Project 671 or Scorpion Fish by the Soviet Navy and given the NATO designation Victor-1, the Victor-class was a series of nuclear-powered attack submarines designed to counter enemy vessels, especially American nuclear attack submarines. Displacing 4,750 long-ton submerged, the 309-foot, 5-inch K-314 had a crew complement of 94 and was capable of making a speed of 25 knots. Although its exact armament at the time is still classified, the submarine was likely armed with both torpedoes and missiles, including SS N-15 Starfish nuclear-armed anti-submarine missiles. The Kitty Hawk was aware that it was being shadowed by the submarine since it had left the South Korean port of Pusan on March 19th. Such behavior was not uncommon, as an officer aboard Kitty Hawk explained to the New York Times. They play cat and mouse with us all the time. As part of their tracking, the U.S. had simulated destroying the submarine that has had units in a position where they could have destroyed the submarine in a combat situation 15 times. A former aviator who piloted a P-3B Orion anti-submarine and surveillance aircraft explained, Chasing Ivan was great fun. Serious business, but nevertheless great fun. The only problem was that when you caught Ivan, you had to let him go. Well, the Kitty Hawk knew that they were being shadowed by the submarine and had a general idea where it was, tracking submarines was not an exact science. David Rogers, who was then captain of the Kitty Hawk, was quoted at the time saying, Sometimes we had him. We knew exactly where he was. Sometimes he slipped away from us. On the night of March 21st, the Kitty Hawk was leaving the Sea of Japan, heading south to the Yellow Sea. As they deployed, the Kitty Hawk's escorts moved away, some 2.5 miles distant. This, in essence, left the Kitty Hawk blind to the location of the K-314. 
The carrier did not have its own sonar equipment, but instead relied on its escort vessels and aircraft to track the submarine. If it were a wartime situation, the submarine would never have gotten within the battle group, Pentagon spokesman Michael Birch explained in a UPI report. In peacetime, it's not required that the Navy keep 24-hour watch on Soviet submarines. Birch continued, These were peacetime conditions. It's not unusual to lose contact. Still, the pilot of the P-3B Orion explained that he and his crew knew that the submarine was in the area of the carrier, and in fact speculated that the submarine was attempting a maneuver where it tries to hide underneath the carrier to mask the submarine's sound, a technique which the pilot said generally doesn't work. But the K-314 wasn't trying to hide. Instead, the submarine, under the command of Captain Vladimir Evsinko, had lost track of the Kitty Hawk. The most likely reason was simply the rough seas. An expert quoted in the Washington Post commented that it is a very confusing world beneath the surface, and observed that the Sea of Japan, which is relatively shallow and is teeming with commercial and military ships, is one of the noisiest in the world, confusing the sonar that submarines use to track other ships. There is an additional problem as well, as sonar, which tracks sound, leaves a notorious blind spot in the baffles behind a submarine where the noise of its own screws makes it impossible to detect other ships across an approximately 60-degree arc. Some sailors suggest that either the Kitty Hawk had made an abrupt course change or was engaging in a deceptive lighting exercise, so the ship would change its running lighting configuration to appear like the guided missile cruiser USS Long Beach. While such operations would have been intended to confuse surface ships, it may also have confused the K-314. In any case, having lost his target, Captain Ivsenko decided to bring the K-314 to periscope depth. When he looked through the periscope, he was stunned to see that he and the Kitty Hawk were on a collision course. He immediately ordered the submarine to dive, but by then, it was already too late. At approximately 10 p.m., some 150 miles off the coast of Korea, in rough seas and pitch black night, the nuclear-powered and armed Soviet submarine K-314 collided with the nuclear-armed carrier USS Kitty Hawk. Captain Rogers was on the bridge at the time, monitoring one of the ship's radars. He said, We felt a sudden shudder, a very violent shudder. The radar was designed to detect surface contacts and would have not have seen the still submerged submarine. There was no indication that anyone on the Kitty Hawk saw the submarine in the moments before the collision, and there likely wouldn't have been time to make a response if they had. A sailor on the flight deck felt the, the shudder too, explaining, That is something you normally don't feel on a carrier. A sailor in the mess room said his tray jumped up four inches. Others, however, seemed to barely notice, writing the shutter off as rough seas. One sailor described acting shipmates in a TV lounge if they felt something, and they insisted that he was crazy. On the P-3 Orion, they could hear a great scraping noise through their hydrophones. Sailors on the Kitty Hawk said the scraping noise lasted five to eight minutes as the submarine dragged along the keel. The K-314 apparently rolled over as it dragged, losing ballast control. This would have thrown the crew around rather violently, but might have saved the conning tower and communications equipment, which would have been damaged or destroyed had they collided with the giant aircraft carrier. Evsinko was quoted on the website Russia Beyond, recalling that the first thought was that the conning tower had been destroyed and the submarine's body was cut to pieces. They confirmed that the periscope and antennas were still working when they felt a second strike on the starboard side. The collision could have been much worse. It was a glancing blow off the right side of Kitty Hawk's bow. The second strike that Evsinko felt was when the submarine's propeller struck the hull of the Kitty Hawk, breaking off a piece that was left in the Kitty Hawk's bow. The submarine was forced to surface. The Kitty Hawk immediately launched a pair of SH-3 Sea King helicopters to render assistance. The submarine appeared to have a dent or crease between its stern and sail. It was reported moving at a slow five knots towards the Soviet naval base at Vladivostok while the guided missile cruiser, Petropavlovsk, steamed apparently to the submarine's assistance. The submarine did not answer the Kitty Hawk's offers of assistance, nor did it request any, and the Soviet government refused to comment. News reports at the time said that the Kitty Hawk detected no nuclear leak from the submarine, and that President Reagan was apprised of the situation. The Kitty Hawk remained for approximately two hours in order to be available in case it needed to render assistance, but then continued on its course. Other U.S. Navy ships remained in the area. While the initial reports were that the Kitty Hawk had taken only superficial damage, within a day the Navy reported that the carrier was taking on water. The collision had ruptured a fuel tank storing aircraft fuel, which was then becoming contaminated with seawater. The crew had to pump the fuel from the tank. The Kitty Hawk had a hole in the bow and a gash from the submarine's propeller below the waterline. Divers the next day brought up a piece of the propeller that had been lodged in the hull, and the crew had it mounted in a hangar. 
The Navy described the damage as minor, saying that it could be repaired at sea and was not significant enough to affect normal operations. Although crew members aboard Kitty Hawk speculated that there was a significant risk for the crew of the submarine after being rolled over in a collision, the Russian Navy has never provided information on the extent of the damage to the K-314. Several members of the Kitty Hawk and other U.S. ships' crews noted seeing welding sparks as members of the K-314 crew engaged in apparent repairs. The K-314 was not able to return to base under its own power and was eventually met by a seagoing tug. The report in Russia Beyond quotes Captain Evsinko saying that there was no loss of life aboard the submarine. The general feeling aboard the Kitty Hawk was that the submarine had taken more damage than the carrier, prompting jokes about the Kitty Hawk being the first anti-submarine carrier weapon. The crew painted a red submarine on the ship's island near the bridge to mark their victory, but the Navy later made them remove it. The Kitty Hawk underwent repairs at Subic Bay Naval Base in the Philippines, which crew members described as filling the damaged voids with concrete. During the repairs, it was discovered that some of the submarine's specialized outer coating had scraped off onto Kitty Hawk, could be analyzed along the U.S. a minor intelligence coup. In the aftermath of the collision, the U.S. Navy was quick to blame the K-314 for the collision. They noted the K-314 was in violation of several elements of the 1972 Incidents at Sea Accord that was specifically intended to reduce the chance of such collisions. The submarine was operated within the American formation, did not use required navigational lights. Submarines are also required to give way to other vessels when they are surfacing. Admiral James D. Watkins, the U.S. Chief of Naval Operations at the time, described F. Cinco as showing uncharacteristically poor seamanship and not staying clear of the Kitty Hawk. While there was no official response from the Soviets, Russia Beyond noted that Captain F. Cinco was relieved of his post, suggesting that they agreed that the collision was his responsibility. The USS Kitty Hawk continued to serve clear into the next century and wasn't decommissioned until 2009 after an impressive nearly 49 years service in the United States Navy. She was the last oil-fired U.S. carrier to serve. And as of 2019, there's actually some talk of possibly recommissioning the Kitty Hawk as the easiest way to achieve President Trump's goal of a 12-carrier fleet. There are also efforts to raise money to turn the Kitty Hawk into a museum ship, a prospect that would be far less expensive than trying to do the same with a retired nuclear aircraft carrier. In 1985, the K-314 was involved in a nuclear accident. During refueling, fuel rods were removed improperly and caused the reactor to melt down. It caused radioactive contamination across a 6-kilometer area, killed 10 people that were engaged in the procedure. In the end, it's difficult to judge the impact of the collision in 1984. The damage to both ships was eventually described as minor, and both fleets kept the event from escalating into something much larger. But certainly a Soviet nuclear submarine running into a nuclear-armed U.S. aircraft carrier at the height of the Cold War was an event that was, well, fraught with danger. And of course, there could have been significant loss of life, especially if there had been damage to the K-314's reactor core. Sometimes the story about what did not happen is as interesting as the story that what did. The fact that an event was, well, far less catastrophic than it might have been is history that deserves to be remembered. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. And I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.